Every story, no matter how epic, no matter how treacherous, no matter how insurmountable, must eventually come to an end. The tale of Bobby the Squawit has been over a year in the making. I don't think anyone could have predicted all the twists and turns it would take. In part one, we met Bobby for the very first time and watched him grow from a tiny squirrel to a slayer of nightmares. And in part two, Bobby's power continued to grow and grow until he was more myth than squirrel, standing alone in the face of hordes of enemies and still bringing the mighty Raihan to his knees. But all that is in the past, and the final act of this story is about to unfold. One way or another, the story of Bobby ends here. Today, we finally answer the question we've all been asking. Can you beat Pokemon Shield with just a Squovit? If you haven't seen part one or part two of this series yet, you probably should do that first, but I know it's been a little while, so here's a quick recap. My mission is to beat Leon with just one single Squovit. Specifically, Bobby the Squovit. I gave him an Everstone just to make sure he wouldn't evolve because we don't want no Greedence up in here. The main crux of my strategy up to this point has been the move Stockpile. It raises your defense and special defense up to three times so it can ensure that Bobby can actually live attacks. And then of course, there's Bobby's signature move, Spit Up, which gets rid of all your boosts from stockpiles in exchange for major damage. He's also been rocking Body Slam as his main attacking move for a while now, and either Dig or Bite for coverage. In part one, Alistair was a major roadblock because he was immune to all of Bobby's strongest attacks, and in part two, Raihan was particularly terrible because he insisted on fighting in double battles, meaning Bobby was at a two versus one disadvantage. But, based on the fact that we're here in part three, you can probably guess what went down. All right, with all that out of the way, let us resume our epic tale. When we last left our heroes, they had just defeated Raihan to get their eighth and final gym badge. The only thing left now is to defeat Leon and finally claim their title as champions. But before we could get to Winden, we first had to traverse the snowy tundra of Route 10. It wasn't too bad, all things considered. There was a scare early on with the Steelix who got to plus six on curses, then completely whiffed an Iron Tail. There was also a Darmanitan who tried to use Taunt to block Bobby's signature stockpile strategy, but apparently really, really liked that idea because he used Taunt three more times. All in all, it was a slow and methodical walk to Winden, but not a very dangerous one. I only had to heal Bobby once and only because he was running low on PP. Alas, Bobby had grown so much in power that Mother Nature posed very little threat to him. Before long, we had arrived. Winden, the final city of the game, home of the championship tournament. Bobby and I didn't come here to see the sights, so we headed directly for the stadium to kick this tournament off. First up is the qualifying matches, and our first opponent is the most overrated character in the game, if you saw my video on Pokemon Rivals, you already know who it is, Marnie. If you disagree, again, please direct all complaints to at Editor Richard on Twitter. That is at Editor Richard. That would be great. I'll be honest, if you've seen one Marnie battle, you've seen them all, so I'll breeze through this one real quick. Bobby started off the match, like always, by setting up three stockpiles. Lipard used a couple of nasty plots in the meantime, which was definitely concerning, but while Dark Pulse certainly did a lot, it was not enough, and Lipard went down to but a single hit. Up next was Scrafty, who used Swagger. And that was pretty much the game right there. Toxicroak was up next, and he used Toxic immediately. This was a bit of a problem, seeing as I had completely forgotten to stock up on full restores, but thankfully, I had a Lumberry ready to go. After that was settled, I used Dig to seal the deal, but... Apparently, it had no guard or something because it managed to get Bobby with another Toxic while it was underground. When her Moropeco hit the field, I used another Lumberry, so it wasn't a huge deal, but 
Marnie did use the opportunity to use Torment, which I thought was going to be a big problem, but it ended up dying in a single hit anyway. Last but not least, her Gigantamax Grimmsnarl. This Pokemon actually had the potential to be a problem thanks to its signature G-Max Snooze, which could have put Bobby to sleep, but luckily, it was actually already paralyzed after a spark from the Moropeko earlier, so Bobby was able to one-shot it with a Swagger Boosted Max Strike. And just like that, Marnie had been defeated for the final time. Can't say I'm too bummed about it. But sadly, this warming up period couldn't last forever, because up next is the far better rival in terms of both character development and battle prowess, Hop. He's given us our fair share of trouble in the past, and this time... <sighs> this time was no different. He led with his usual dub wool, which was somehow even more annoying this time than it had been in the past. As Bobby set up three stockpiles, dub wool used Cotton Guard, which raised its defense by three stages. After that, it was a battle of the body slams, and a great war of attrition it was. Just when it seemed like Bobby was about to win out, Hop used a full restore and almost killed Bobby with a crit, but luckily, I remembered to buy some of my own after the Marnie battle. It was a long and tedious battle, but like so many times before, Bobby eventually came out on top. Next up was his Snorlax, and this one was another slugfest. Hammer Arm did a fair amount of damage to Bobby, but in the end, it was no match for Bobby's mythic body slams. Next up was by far Hop's weirdest Pokemon, Pinkurchin. Dig was super effective on this guy, which was nice because Bobby was running dangerously low on body slams after the last two fights. But sadly, nothing with Hop can ever be easy, so of course, this thing spammed Curse a bunch, and Bobby was immobilized about a hundred times off of paralysis from the double's body slam, and eventually the pincushion landed a critical hit off a of poison jab to take Bobby out. Annoying for sure, but Hop was far from unbeatable, so I wasn't worried. At this point, losing to Hop is just a tradition, and I wouldn't want to break it now. The rematch started largely the same, except Dubwool used two Cotton Guards this time, so it took even longer to kill him. Very fun, very good, very fun, love that. I got rid of Bobby's paralysis when Snorlax came out, so this time, Bobby was ready to go by the time the Pincurchin hit the field. It took one look into Bobby's eyes and thought, yeah, you know what? There's no way I can beat that, I'm just a thing that you stick pins into, and that's an immortal god. So, it didn't even bother setting up curses, and just went down to a dig. After that, Hop sent out yet another super stally Pokemon in Corviknight, because, I don't know, he hates me I guess? I had to use a Lepaberry to get some PP back on Body Slam, but in time, the night fell from the sky. But, not before giving us a free attack boost with Swagger. Obviously, Hop was in the bathroom for the match with Marnie or something. Last but not least was Hop's starter, Bobby's rival from the very beginning, Cinderace. It was a formidable foe, and Max Knuckle had the potential to undo all of our hard and extremely tedious work. Seriously, I can't stress just how annoying this battle was, but Bobby had had enough of Hop's shenanigans at this point and took it out with one single Max Quake. And with that, Hop was finally defeated. Still love him as a character, but I say this from the bottom of my heart, there is nothing I would rather do less than fight this man again. But wait, what's that? Could it be? Could it be? Yes, it's time to take a break from the exciting Pokemon League for some poorly implemented story. So we gotta find some bad guy named Eric three times before we can get into Rose Tower, but he literally doesn't leave this one cul-de-sac. Nice try, Eric. Inside the tower, we've got one of the oldest video game tropes in the book, an elevator gauntlet. I was actually a little worried for this part because all of the Marco Cosmo goons have steel types, and I was nearly out of digs by the time I even reached Rose Tower. But then I remembered, who needs type advantages when you've got spit up, am I right? Also, you team up with Hop and he heals you after every single battle, so in actuality, it posed literally no challenge whatsoever. After that, we had a battle with Oleana in literally the most insane office ever. I've heard people wanting the corner office so they could have more windows, 
but this is a little excessive. Anyway, Oleana led with a Frostlass who burned me and then set up a bunch of double teams while I was getting my stockpiles up, so if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go see if I can smash this big glass dome with my head. That seems a lot more fun than dealing with this crap. I tried to use a full heal to get rid of the burn, but she just immediately burned me again. Bobby was surprisingly accurate considering the Frostlass was at max evasion, but in the end, I decided to use some X accuracies that I had in my bag before I gave myself a concussion from sheer boredom. Frostlass eventually went down to Bobby's very last dig, so hopefully I won't be needing any of those later on. After that was my Lotic. I used the first turn to heal Bobby's burn, and then just went to work with some body slams. And the Milotic answered back with some recovers! Oh, more stall! No, no, it's fine, I don't got a schedule to keep or anything, no, I got all the time in the world for you to just throw away! Eventually, through sheer force of will alone, the Milotic went down, and next up was Salazzle. Thank God, a Pokemon that can't stall. Bobby didn't have any digs left, but Body Slam was able to take it out just fine, and you have no idea how good that felt. After that was a Sarina with a Tourette. Are you kidding? <laughs> Last but not least, Gigantamax Garboder, who just used attacks. No status conditions, no stalling, no crazy stat buffs, just attacks. Thank God, because I don't know how much more of that I could have taken. And no, no, I'm not talking about Bobby. At this point, he's a legend in his own right. But I, I am but a mere man. With the memory of that experience sufficiently repressed, I was ready to move on. So Chairman Rose shows up and reveals himself as an evil environmentalist, trying to... Trying to solve the energy crisis, and Leon is advocating for procrastinating and letting future generations deal with our problems? Alright. And with that terrible, terrible detour behind us, it was finally time to return to the fun part, the Pokemon League Finals. We were set to face Nessa in the first round, but before we could, Bede showed up like it was the WWE or something and demanded a match with his career on the line. Now, normally Bobby wouldn't bother with scum like him, but I was more than happy to retire this human trash bag for good, so I accepted. So Bede led with a Mawile that was apparently as incompetent as its trainer, because it missed two rough plays as Bobby set up his stockpiles in peace and took it down without any problems. Guard of War didn't fare much better, getting paralyzed off the very first body slam. Bede thought he was clever when its ability synchronized meant that Bobby got paralyzed as well, but I simply used a full restore, and we went on our merry way, ending his career. Rapidash somehow did even worse than the two before it, and before long, it was down to Bede's final Pokemon, Hattern. Bobby was admittedly pretty low at this point, so I used a Max Potion instead of Dynamaxing on the first turn, which worked flawlessly. And easy as that, Bede will never have another Pokemon battle again. You're welcome, Galar. Alright, now it was time for the actual finals to begin. I wasn't sure if you were able to leave the stadium once you started the finals, but I knew there was a possibility that I would have to go right into a fight with Alistair after Nessa, so I went to the Move Tutor and got Bite back instead of Dig, just to be safe. And finally, after all that, it was time to actually start the finals. I stuck with my bread and butter and had Bobby set up some stockpiles first, but she led with a Glycopod and set up two Swords Dances. Before anything could get too out of hand, I fired off a spit up to take it out. Her next Pokemon was a literal goldfish with a horn, so I was able to set them back up with no issues. The Seeking went down to some body slams, and the Barrascuta quickly followed suit. Pelipper could have been a problem since it has Drizzle, which sets up the rain and boosts the power of all water type moves, but it also had Roost and literally stalled out its own rain before going down. Finally, it was time for her ace. The last time we faced her way back in part one, she had a regular Dynamax Dreadnought, but apparently she kicked that one to the curb for a newer, cooler Gigantamax one. While Dig certainly would have been nice to have for this thing, Max Darkness worked just fine. I fired off two of them and used my last turn of Dynamaxing to heal up. Since Max Darkness lowers the target's special defense, 
When we went back to normal, I was able to fire off a spit up and take it out, no worries. And just like that, round one of the finals was completed. Turns out you can leave in between matches, so I could have kept Dig for that last one, but it worked out in the end. But Nessa was only the beginning, and in the semifinals, we were pitted against an old nemesis. Bobby and I once again had to come face to face with the faceless foe that gave us so much trouble in the past. It's been over a year since we last saw each other, but Bobby and I could run no longer. It was once again time for us to enter the Nightmare of Alistair. But I wasn't worried. Bobby had conquered it once before and I was sure he could do it again. And surely, surely it could not be as bad as the first time we did it, right? Right? Alistair led with a new mon, Dusk Noir. As always, I set up my stockpiles, and good news, Dusk Noir kinda sucks. It was on the bulky side, but barely did any damage in return, so Bobby was free to just bite away to its heart's content. And then, it disabled Bite. Bobby's only other moves at the moment were Body Slam, Stockpile, and Spit Up, all of which were useless against the Ghost. In hindsight, I probably could have gotten rid of Spit Up for this match, it wouldn't have been able to hit anything anyway, but at this point, Spit Up is no mere attack, no, it is a symbol of justice, of Bobby's unfathomable might. You can't just replace it like some common attack. As for Body Slam, yeah, you know what, you got me there. But it was too late for that, so as it stands, all I could do was wait. I used the berry trick from the last episode to burn through turns to preserve my PP until Bite was undisabled, but then Dusknoir would just outspeed me and disable it again. That happened 12 times until it ran out of all of its moves except for Shadow Punch and Bobby was finally able to put it and me out of our misery. And before you ask in the comments why I didn't just, I don't know, say use one body slam while Bite was disabled so that it would disable body slam instead of Bite when it came back, well, it's because I... Well, it's, you see, because I, I had to... <gasps> so after my flawless takedown of the Dusk Noir, Chandelure hit the field and immediately used Will-O-Wisp. Annoying, for sure, but at this point, this game had taken too much of my sanity for me to care. I used a Forward Sword to get rid of it anyway once the Poltergeist hit the field, who immediately set up three nasty plots and still didn't do over half of Bobby's health with a Giga Drain. But you thought the Dusk Noir was bad? You haven't seen anything yet. Okay, actually, the Dusk Noir was pretty bad, but so was the right-hand man to the devil himself, Cursula, my nemesis from Part 1. Apparently, the memory of this wicked piece of coral was still fresh in Bobby's mind because he almost one-shot it with a bite right off the bat. But we quickly learned that the Nightmare was never truly vanquished back then. No. Rather, it had been festering, growing all this time, and now Alistair had a new trick up his sleeve. Strength Sap. Not only does it lower Bobby's attack for the rest of the battle, but it also heals the thing. <laughs> Thankfully, it also had the ability weak armor, which means its defense was lowered every single time Bobby attacked it, so it sort of evened out. But Cursula was never meant to take down Bobby itself. Not then, and not now. Because while it may have been defeated, it crippled Bobby so that the devil could finish him off itself. By the time Gengar hit the field, Bobby was at minus 3 attack and half health. I couldn't risk not Dynamaxing in order to heal, so I just went for it. I should have known Bobby wouldn't go down that easy, because he was able to take a max ooze and despite the attack drops, Bobby's max darkness still did a lot. Bobby just barely lived a max darkness from Gengar, so I needed to heal in the last turn of Dynamaxing. But it was a fool's errand, because at this point Gengar was effectively at plus 3 special attack. Gengar put Bobby to sleep and then took it out with a critical hit sludge bomb. After all this time, all those battles, I thought Bobby would trounce the nightmare this time. But it looks like the only thing that really grew was our egos. Five gyms later, and we still fell to the very same Gengar from part one. But Bobby didn't make it this far by giving up. 
Sure, he lost his fair share of battles in the past, but that's never been what this story was about. No, no, no. It's about all the times that Bobby got back up, brushed himself off, looked death in the face, and said no. So if you think for one second that the devil has any power over this squirrel, you are wrong. Hey, Bobby, how'd you like to sink your teeth into a little boy's pets, huh? Now, that was, that was kind of dark. That was a little, that was a little, I'll tone it down. No, no, get him, Bobby, get him. So Bobby and I marched back into the stadium, and already, Alistair sensed something was different. Something about Bobby threw him off his game, and he used Sable early and ended up disabling Stockpile. Bobby was free to bite away. This time, the Duskmoor went down in a mere four turns, as opposed to over 50. The Disable was gone by the time Chandelure hit the field, so I took the time to set the rest back up. Aside from that, it went down pretty much the same. Miss Potts didn't even bother with the Nasty Pots this time, and just accepted his fate, and even the wicked Kursla was only able to get two strength saps off before going down, and Bobby was a lot healthier when the devil arrived. As a result, I didn't have to spend the last turn of Dynamax in healing. Instead, Bobby was able to fire off three Max Darknesses to once and for all put the Nightmare of Alistair to bed. And with that, the cerebral battle that began all the way back at the climax of Act 1 was finally done. But the war that was the Pokemon League Finals had only just begun. It's fitting then that when our nemesis from Part 1 was vanquished, his counterpart from Part 2 would be the one to take his place. It's time for Raihan Round 2 and it was really, really anticlimactic. So before the battle, I decided to put Dig back on instead of Bite, just because it's a little bit stronger. Then, I went onto the pitch, and there was Raihan, waiting to challenge me to a singles battle, which was so much easier. He led with a Torkoal, which was pretty easy to deal with. Not for lack of trying, though. It was busting out Lava Plumes and one-turn Solar Beams in the Drought, along with super effective Body Presses. But they just didn't do all that much, and before long, a slightly larger, cooler fire turtle was on the field. Turtonator's shell trap scared me, so I made sure I was on full health before even touching it. Turns out, shell trap did a lot less damage than I thought, and it went down no problem as well. Look, I'm trying my best to make this seem dramatic, but for my notes on Gudra, I literally just wrote the word easy. Even my nemesis from the last part, Flygon, was a disappointment. It didn't even have breaking swipe. His Gigantamax Duraludon did have Max Knuckle just like the last episode, except it barely did any damage to begin with. Nothing multiplied by two is still nothing, and luckily I had enough PP for Max Quakes to take it down. I know I should be happy for an easy battle after all the crap I've been through up to this point, but it's just kind of sad to see how far Raihan has fallen. My ultimate nemesis up to this point, the climax of the Pokemon League, the man who almost single-handedly, or, well, double-handedly, ended this story himself, reduced to an afterthought, a footnote. It's kind of sad, really. It makes you... Oh, oh, do you hear that? No time for existential crises. That's right, it's time for more poorly implemented story. So right before the champion match, Chairman Rose pops up on the screen and is basically like, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, hello, I am the, I'm the bad guy here, by the way, so, uh, you better, you better come stop me, cause I am, uh, about to cause the apocalypse or something. Whatever. So we had to book it back to Slumbering Wheeled to justify having some cool dogs on the cover of the box, but at least Bobby got to have a nice little family reunion, so that was pretty good. And after that, it was off to Hammerlock Stadium, where we had to face Chairman Rose. Who cares? Ho oh, ho, never mind. This song is hype. All right, I'm invested again. Bobby, do your thing. So he led with an Escavalier that set up two swords dances. Yikes. Luckily, Megahorn misses a lot, but I was basically caught in a heel loop until he landed a crit with Drill Run. All right, Rose, all right, all right. Perhaps I let your complete and utter lack of an interesting character arc cloud my judgment of you, that's fine. But you know what? This episode, I've had my fair share of easy battles and tough battles, and I think I prefer the challenge. So, Rose, do your worst. All right, all right, let's try this again. 
Got those stockpiles up to take him out before he can. Oh! Oh, I'm dead. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. You are a worthy adversary indeed, Chairman, but I will not be made a fool of here today. I will not be undone by a villain as bland as thee. You may think you're clever with your dances and your critical hits, but your little bug playing dress-up is not stronger than Bobby. Nothing is stronger than Bobby, and I'll prove it. I have a strategy so big brain, so insane, so crazy, but just crazy enough to work. I started off the battle the exact same way, setting up stockpiles while Excavalier got two sword dances up. And then, I Dynamaxed. On the first Pokemon, crazy, I know, I know. But if I could just take this one guy out quickly, the rest of the battle would be smooth sailing, I just knew it. I fired off a few Max Quakes and slayed the Wicked Bug Knight before he could do too much, and my special defense was through the roof in the process. Like I said, smooth sailing from here on out. Next up was a Ferrothorn who has Curse. Okay, okay, no big deal. I just gotta take him out quickly. I'll use my Spit Up to take it out. Oh no. By some divine intervention, the Ferrothorn survived a Spit Up. Bobby tried his best to get the stockpiles back up, but it wasn't enough. Ferrothorn got a critical hit with Gyro Ball, and Bobby fell once again. No, 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 I, I don't get it. Bobby, you were supposed to be the best of us. It was foretold that you would conquer all the Gala region. It shouldn't be possible. He's not stronger than Bobby. He is not stronger, nothing, nothing is stronger than Bobby. No, you know what, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It's fine, we can do this. I have a, a master plan that will guarantee our success. Ready, ready, here it is. I don't know, get some more levels maybe? And so it was back to the wild area for grinding once again. But all the while, I couldn't help thinking to myself, would it be enough? Were a couple of levels really all I needed? This guy was strong, stronger than Bobby. And I'd only seen his first two Pokemon. And that's when it hit me. <sighs> They're just stronger than Bobby. Simple as that. And that's why they'll lose. All this time, I've been trying to just brute force my way through every battle. But Bobby's just a squirrel for God's sake. I've been trying to be like fire when I really need to be like water. Use their own overwhelming power against them. Make their strength. Bobby's strength. Basically all that is code for I looked up Bobby's moveset and saw that he could learn counter. With this revelation in mind, I replaced Body Sling with counter and went back for round four. Escavalier decided to do me a solid and wait for all of Bobby's stockpiles to be set up before using Swords Dance. Then it fired off a Mega Horn and counter worked like a charm. Ferrothorn showed up next and I basically just had to wait for him to attack me before I could do anything. His ability Iron Barbs made it so digs weren't really worth it. He used Curse once and tried a Body Press, after which Counter didn't kill, so the Ferrothorn used another Curse, then another Body Slam, and it was done. Simple as that. Kling Clang did laughable damage with a Wild Charge and got bopped by some digs. Ha! That's what you get, you couple of stupid physics defying gears. Get out of here! Perserker also sucked, though he did get a crit with an iron head that Bobby lived, of course. He was actually looking a little low on health by the time Kaparaja came out though, so I decided to risk a heal instead of Dynamaxing immediately. This turned out to be unnecessary since Kaparaja also sucks. And with that, Chairman Rose was finally defeated. Mm, it feels good. Turns out he used the classic 10-year-old strat of having like one, maybe two good mods in your party, and the rest are basically just there to fill up space. Though Counter had served us incredibly well in that last battle. Afterwards, I did get rid of it for Body Slam once again, because I had a feeling it would be a bit more useful in the battle to come. Hop and I headed to the roof to see Leon casually attempting to catch a legendary Pokemon in a regular old Pokeball and fail spectacularly. Rookie mistake. Well, looks like Bobby and I are going to have to handle this one ourselves. 
I started to set up stockpiles like usual, but realized based on the damage Eternatus was doing that I probably didn't need all three. Save some time, set myself up for an epic only using a fraction of my power reveal? It's a win-win. Bobby was eating up critical hit cross poisons like they were a bowl of Cheerios, and after three digs, it was finished. Or half finished anyway. Turns out we had ourselves a Princess Bride situation, you know, where they both reveal, I'm not left-handed, only this time he revealed that he actually was a big hand the whole time. So on one side, we've got a Lovecraftian cosmic entity moments away from destroying the entire world. And on the other side, Bobby. I almost feel bad for old Eternatus at this point. Now, I think we all know Bobby could have easily handled this thing by himself, but Hop wanted to pitch in, and who am I to stop him? So, we gotta wait a few turns for the doggos from the box to make their dramatic entrance, and dang, everybody wants to fight alongside Bobby, don't they? Eh, well, I guess I could use the moral support. And as to be expected, Bobby completely carried this battle and totally didn't spend practically the whole time healing and hiding underground while the two legends did most of the work. We did let old Zamazenta get the final hit though, out of charity more than anything. As much as I tried to avoid it, the game forced me to catch this dumb thing. Well, if you say so, hope you don't mind spending the rest of eternity inside a computer with old Ted here. So the dogs peace out, and now, after all this time, there's only one thing left to do. Face the champion himself, Leon. But before that, there's just one last detour we need to take, and it's back to Route 2 for, fittingly, two reasons. First of all, I wanted to pick up the TM for Payback. It's a dark type move similar to Bite, only with a slightly lower base power. However, if you're slower than your opponent, its power gets doubled, making it base 100. And since speed was never Bobby's strong suit, it's going to be a lot better than Bite basically every time. Honestly, I probably should have gotten this a while ago, and I mean, come on. How poetic would it have been to use a move called Payback on Alistair? But, alas, I just forgot. At first, I was planning to get rid of Dig like I usually do, but I ended up getting rid of Spit Up. Yes, the mighty Spit Up, Bobby's signature move. The move that had taken us so far. But recently, it's become less of a weapon and more of a crutch. We need to prove that there's more to Bobby than his projectile vomit. In hindsight, this probably wasn't the best idea, but we'll get back to that. But there was one other reason we came back to this place. Route 2. The place where it all began. Over a year ago, we met Bobby for the first time on this very route. He was just an ordinary squirrel back then. Now, he is a slayer of gods. And one last thing, Bobby was just on the cusp of getting level 80, so I decided to get him over the edge real quick, just in case. But like I said at the top, no story, no matter how epic, can last forever. The final chapter is upon us. There's only one thing left to be done. One final battle. Leon, the undefeatable champion, versus Bobby, savior of the world. One way or another, it all ends right here. The crowd was roaring. The air on the pitch was apparently still, even though I can see the wind blowing through your cape, Leon. 
The moments before the battle seemed to stretch for a millennia. But then, the gladiators took their places. Leon led with Aegislash, a formidable foe with many tricks up its sleeve. Or, or up its scabbard? For starters, its signature move, King Shield, had the potential to cripple Bobby for the rest of the battle. Not only does it completely protect Aegislash from all damage, but if Bobby makes physical contact with it while it's guarding, its attack is lowered by two stages, and there is no way for me to get it back. And on top of that, it's got Sacred Sword, a move that is not only super effective, but completely ignores any defense boosts from Stockpile. We had to play this very carefully. I used Stockpile while I waited for him to use King Shield. After a few turns, he finally did. I knew he was likely to fail if he tried to use it again, so I clicked Payback and blew him away in one hit. Next up, Haxorus. It did a fair amount of damage with Outrage, but nothing Bobby couldn't handle at this point. I got the rest of his stockpiles up and then, after getting Leon to use one of his four stores, took him out with some Bobby Slams. Get it? Get it, Bobby? I cannot believe it took me this long to come up with that. Next up was Rhyperior, which is actually kind of a problem. Dig is the obvious choice here since it's super effective, but Rhyperior actually has solid rock, so it's not as effective as you'd think. On top of that, it's got Earthquake, which can do huge damage to an opponent who is underground. So instead, I decided to whittle it down with Body Slams and Payback. Problem is, Bobby actually outsped this Rock Rhino, so Payback was only half as effective as I wanted it to be. And on top of all that, Bobby could barely live a critical hit from a Stone Edge at full health, so I had to constantly heal just to be safe. It took a while and a lot of my PP, but nothing Bobby and I weren't used to at this point. Rillaboom was up next, who decided to just spam Endeavor nonstop, meaning when it lived on 7 HP, it brought Bobby down to 7 HP as well when the Dragapult came in. Luckily, Dragapult did way less damage than I thought it would, and I got Bobby nice and healthy and even used one of the max elixirs I had in my bag, just in case. After that, all it took was two paybacks to seal the deal. And now, it was time for the main event. The finale, Bobby versus Gigantamax Charizard. My original plan was to use Max Quake to finish it off real quick, but then I remembered the fact that I am indeed an idiot and Charizard is a flying type, meaning he is immune to ground type moves. So instead, Bobby fired off Max Strike after Max Strike as Charizard retaliated with Max Overgrowths and Airstreams, but never his signature G Max Wildfire. Lucky for us, but unfortunately, the non-dragon just barely lived the third max strike. Now, we were both back to normal. I healed Bobby up just to be extra safe. Fire Blast did just a hair under half of Bobby's health. This was it. The moment of truth. Bobby went for one last Bobby Slam. And that was it. Charizard was slain. The undefeatable champion had lost, and Bobby had finally claimed his throne. After all the struggles, every mind-numbingly frustrating battle with Hop, every gym battle, the nightmare of Alistair, the ball guy betrayal, Raihan's double battles, Oleana and Rose, Eternatus, and now Leon, Bobby was still standing tall. So to answer the question, yes. It is possible to beat Pokemon Shield with just one Squovit. It's not an easy journey, and not one that I would recommend to the faint of heart, but it can be done. To be honest, I'm not sure if I had the strength to do something like this ever again, but Bobby, old pal, I'm glad I did. The end. Oh, what if I didn't win with Burmy next time?